Hello and welcome to another episode of Newswire. I'm Aiza Umar. Now, Israel says its military is getting ready in case it has to get involved in any escalation as things are heating up between U.S. and Iran as usual. This comes from the Israeli foreign minister just a day after a senior Iranian parliamentarian gave out a warning on Iranian TV that if the U.S. attacks Iran, Israel will be destroyed in half an hour. Now, as you know, things have been pretty much unraveling since the U.S. pulled out of the Iran nuclear deal, the JCPOA, last year. It was signed during the Obama administration in 2015 and considered a major milestone in U.S.-Iran relations. So just to give a quick flashback into what that in looked like that time, let's get this. Just now, I spoke on the phone with President Rouhani of the Islamic Republic of Iran. I believe we can reach a comprehensive solution. Today is uh, an historic day. It is a great honor for us to announce that we have reached an agreement on the Iranian nuclear issue. Iran is not interested in the the International Atomic Energy Agency has now verified that Iran has honored its commitments to alter and, in fact, dismantle much of its nuclear program in compliance with the agreement that we reached last July. And that is what the Middle East looked like back in 2013. Cut to 2019, while U.S. President Trump and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un continue with what is widely called their bromance over North, Co North Korea's denuclearization program, which, by the way, is very similar end goal as for Trump's alleged agenda when it comes to Iran. Trump takes a completely different approach with the Middle Eastern oil giant, and not to mention Israel's arch enemy. Now, instead of writing love letters and skipping across demarcation lines, Trump's busy crushing Iran's economy and, in turn, innocent Iranians with sanctions upon sanctions. And instead of this helping in the aim to denuclearize, Iran's just beefing up its uranium enriched stockpile. So we will be talking to our guests, reflecting not only whether Obama got it right or he set the stage for now turning to be a very dangerous situation. So let me introduce our guests from Tehran. We are joined by Sayyid Mustafa Khushchashem, a journalist and an analyst. He's also taught at a number of Iranian universities and academic centers, including international relations faculty of the Iranian foreign ministry. Also from Tehran, we have Mr. Abbas Aslani. He is the editor-in-chief for Iran Front Page, and he's also the visiting scholar at the Center for Middle East Strategic Studies. And from Washington, D.C., we have Mr. Paul Kovika-Martin, the senior director for policy and political affairs right now in Washington, D.C. Thank you so much to all three of you for joining us here. I want to start with you, Mr. Mustafa Khushchashem. Back in September 2013, Obama finally got to do what many presidents had failed in the U.S. to finally stop a very acrimonious relationship with Iran. Do you see it like that, or do you think he pretty much set up the stage for what is unraveling right now? Hello, and thanks for having me. me. Well, to put it in a nutshell, that's right. That's the second uh, part of the, uh, I mean, the second option that you just presented. That, that's it. Uh, uh, up to 2005 or six, the United States uh, tried various options in order to topple the Islamic Republic. That included staging velvet revolutions as well as coup d'etats or uh, provoking civil unrest or, uh, or arming the opposition like the MKO, the terrorist organization. Um, but they failed, and they realized that they may not be able to topple the Islamic Republic. So they came up with a strategy to confine at least uh, Tehran's uh, uh, power component to stop uh, a clash of interests uh, with the United States uh, mm -hmm. and its allies' interests in the region. 
Uh, so they picked up the engagement strategy for the sake of containment mm -hmm. uh, through exercising uh, maximum pressures that included, of course, the crippling sanctions, as they call it, of course, as well as posing credible military threats. Uh, the result uh, they wished for was pushing Tehran to the negotiating table and then um, forcing Tehran to make concessions. And the rest, we saw what happened to uh, the Iranian nuclear enrichment capacity mm -hmm. for at least 10 years under okay. the nuclear deal. Mm -hmm. What they meant was continuing the same path and the same paradigm in order to contain Iran's other power components that included the missile industry as well as Iran's original mm -hmm. clout. And if you remember, I've appeared on your show several times, and I've always been stressing uh, on your TV channel and in my other interviews that Donald Trump is no different than Obama. The only difference is that Donald Trump is exercising this strategy in a very inexperienced manner. In other words, uh, uh, my final sentence could be, um, he doesn't appreciate the way and the balance of the stick and the carrot. Um, okay. uh, that's why he is failing this time. Okay, so Mr. Mustafa, I want to play a soundbite of the U.S. president saying essentially what his beef was with Iran. So let's just play that and then I've got a question for you there. By his own terms, the Iran deal was supposed to contribute to regional and international peace and security. And yet, while the United States adheres to our commitment under the deal, the Iranian regime continues to fuel conflict, terror, and turmoil throughout the Middle East and beyond. Importantly, Iran is not living up to the spirit of the deal. So, Mr. Khosh Jashim, the question really is, here what we hear from uh, President Trump, it seems the real problem is Iran's involvement in proxy wars in the Middle East that Trump has. Well, uh, first of all, um, what Donald Trump says about, about uh, uh, I mean, uh, the, the nuclear deal was uh, to help promote uh, regional peace and stability, uh, that's true because uh, 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 the nuclear deal was endorsed as a non-proliferation document and agreement and, uh, of course, Iran has reiterated uh, time and again that it's not looking for, uh, you know, nuclear, uh, military nuclear capability. But still, uh, the, uh, the United States and Europeans that alleged that Iran was uh, making suspicious moves, they could at least ensure that Iran's uh, all Iranian nuclear facilities were under, and they are still under, uh, 24 hours uh, a day, uh, uh, surveillance by the IAEA. Iran is under check. Iran has gone under the largest number of many hours of inspection by the IAEA all throughout the world in, in the history of that organization. Okay. So they could make sure that Iran, Iran claims that it's moving towards a civilian nuclear program uh, uh, was, you know, true. Now, okay. uh, Iran... Mr. Has, I, Iran has shown, just let me wrap it up like this, that Iran has been, according to American officials, even this uh, administration, according to Europeans and everyone else, Iran has been in full compliance with the letter of the nuclear deal. But the Americans have discarded the nuclear deal, the spirit and the letter altogether. Let's remember that it was a deal on Iran's nuclear program and not Iran's missile or Okay, so power. I get your point here, Mr. Mustafa. Let me bring in Mr. Paul here. Mr. Paul, my question to you. You heard what the uh, pre U.S. president said, that Iran was essentially Iranian regime continues to fuel conflict, terror, and turmoil throughout the region. So is the JCPO essentially that Iran is not complying or is violating the terms, something that Trump has not been very clear on how, is just an excuse? It's definitely an excuse, as your, as the other guests mentioned. The International Atomic Energy Agency, since the uh, nuclear agreement was put in acted in 2015, has constantly said that Iran has been uh, participating and uh, doing the agreement properly, um, and it has doing which has dismantled centrifuges, uh, sh shipped uh, uranium outside the country. Uh, got rid of a nuclear reactor in the city of Iraq, um, and is continuing to have uh, intrusive verification and inspections. So 
uh, until recently, which is earlier this week, Iran has complied with the letter of this agreement um, that was not only agreed to by the U.S., but by Russia, China, U.K., France, Germany, and the European Union. Okay, so again, my question is, Mr. Paul, if this is an excuse, what exactly is President Trump hoping to achieve by bringing up an issue that is a non, has been a non-issue and is, in fact, being counterproductive? Because here we see Iran going exactly towards the direction that Trump says he doesn't want to, which is beefing up his uranium stockpiles. Yeah, it's an interesting question. Uh, and I think it probably depends on who you're asking in the Trump administration. Uh, it's clear to me that if you're asking uh, the N National Security Advisor, Mr. Bolton, um, he has said over and over he he's looked for regime change. Um, also, the Secretary of State, Pompeo, has also made speeches in the past about regime change in Iran. Uh, it does seem like Trump is less interested in, in a war, so it's unclear exactly what he wants. It was very clear that he was against anything the Obama administration had achieved, including uh, this successful nuclear agreement. Uh, and he's looking to so-called have a better deal. Um, I don't think he realizes how difficult that's going to be if he's moving towards actually more of a path of some sort of a, uh, a military intervention, which nobody will win. Okay. So, Mr. Abbas, let's ask you this then. The current situation, as we just talked about in the beginning, is that Israel is now giving statements, the foreign minister of Israel, saying that we're getting ready in case there is some kind of escalation. He's obviously talking about military escalation here. Does this worry you at all, how this uh, situation has changed just in the past two, three days? Well, in fact, <clears throat> Iran, Iran has made clear that it is not afraid of any war or conflict in the region and it is ready to respond if it is attacked militarily. But I think these uh, statements coming from the Israeli side are quite meaningful, saying that there are some parties in the region who do not want to see stability in the region and they want to push Iran and also the United States toward a and escalation as well as they want to say provocation mm -hmm. uh, in order to see a, that conflict between Iran and the United States to happen. But I would say that recently when the United States wanted to attack Iran, uh, they said that they didn't attack Iran because they would have killed about 150 people. But I don't think that a country who has uh, the had the experience of using atomic bombs against the country in the past would care about killing about 150 people. You're referring to Trump's statement on how he decided not to uh, respond to the drone being shot down. Yes. Do you think, do you think uh, and just they, on they that, just on that, Mr. Couldn't. Abbas, just so exactly. So let me ask you this. You think they couldn't based on what? The fact that it was within Iran's territorial waters or the fact that its own very constitution, the U.S. Constitution, wouldn't allow the president to go ahead and make such a provocative act? I would say that the American officials, including the American president, made those remarks in order to save a kind of image in the international arena because they, Iran uh, targeted their drone in, into Iranian airspace. And uh, I would say that uh, the Americans wanted to attack Iran, but when they wanted, to, they could see on their radars that there were a thousand and some hundred missiles ready from Iranian side in case that if, if Iran was attacked, Iran would respond using those missiles which were ready to be launched. And that would say that because Americans were worried about the aftermath of that kind of attack against Iran, they didn't attack the country. Because what Trump is thinking of is a short and quick attack, not a real war. So he is worried about a real war in the region. That's the, why they didn't. Uh, the, and they couldn't uh, launch that okay. kind of military attack right. because he wants to have re-election in the upcoming presidential election in the States. Mr. Paul, what is your take on uh, President Trump's 20 election campaign that is underway also? What would it look like if he were to, irrespective of who starts the first, who makes the first strike, gets embroiled into military activity with Iran? Yeah, I don't, do not think it would be good for his, uh, his election over and over again, polls after polls show that Americans do not want to be in another war of choice in the Middle East. Americans have learned from the debacle that happened in Iraq uh, that any type of war in the Middle East is not only costly in blood, but costly in treasure. 
uh, and a war with Iran is a much different animal than a war with Iraq. Mm -hmm. uh, so I do not think it would be good for um, his election for him to become embroiled in any kind of military intervention uh, with Iran, especially if it ended up moving into a regional conflict that spilled out of control. Okay. And Mr. Mustafa, if this is not going to be good for his election campaign, as polls have shown, as Mr. Paul has highlighted for us here, what do you think is now the way forward? If it doesn't want the altercation with Iran, how does it expect Iran to continue to respond? Because as we understand it, the door for diplomacy is closed. They're not interested to come to the table and talk to the U.S. Um, to, um, uh, to complete your sentence, I need to say that Iran uh, is still complying, in com complying with the nuclear deal. Therefore, um, uh, this is not Iran that has closed the door to diplomacy. That's the United States that has discarded the deal. Therefore, it needs to, you know, shift of uh, uh, its a strategy, its foreign policy towards Iran. If Donald Trump is uh, smart enough, to, and I do believe that he's uh, smart enough uh, because he could beat Hillary Clinton and uh, many others to become a president of the United States, uh, I do believe that uh, he would realize at the end of summer maximum that he has been on a wrong path. He's been moving uh, you know, in the opposite direction of what he should have. And uh, uh, he, he should fire Bolton and change. Now, it's not just Bolton. Well, uh, uh, he needs to make a U-turn towards the nuclear deal. He should get back to the nuclear deal. That would mean a catastrophic failure and defeat for him, of course, and for his reputation. And, uh, you know, he likes to uh, uh, show himself as superior to uh, President Obama, mm -hmm. therefore, that would, you know, crush his chances for uh, winning uh, a, a second election. Mm -hmm. uh, therefore, uh, a way between these two could help him. That mm -hmm. is to say, I believe at the end of summer, he, uh, as we are approaching the, you know, expiry date of the era that sanctions produce their maximum pressure and leave the most impact on the Iranian economy, uh, in the next few months, he would arrive at the conclusion that he needs to change the offer. He should make it much more lucrative to Iran. He would probably offer to remove a part of the sanctions, including those on oil and banking. Uh, uh, still, I don't think that that would be enough for Iran, mm -hmm. but he would move in that direction in order okay. to, you know, charm Iran eventually. All right. So, Mr. Abbas, my question then is, uh, the, one of the senior parliamentarians who said essentially that Israel would be eliminated in half an hour if the U.S. attacked Iran also mentioned there are 36 U.S. military bases in the region, all of them which are close enough for Iran's long-range ballistic missiles. And here I want to quote something that Trump said in uh, earlier this June. He said, I guess you could say, and this is when he was responding to one of the reporters in the White House, uh, whether there would be a, a risk of military confrontation. He said, I guess you could always say that there could be a possibility. What I would like to see with Iran, I would like to see them call me. What do you make of this? Is this not a situation where you put a gun to somebody's head and say, then say, oh, okay, call me? Well, I would say that, you know, there is firstly a confusion in the United States and, include, and inside the White House regarding Iran. Because on the one side, they are saying that they want to negotiate with Iran, but on the other side, they are talking about imposing sanctions against Iranian foreign minister, who is most likely to be the uh, representative of I Iran in case there is going to be any negotiations between Iran and the United States. But on the other hand, we have been seeing a hybrid threat against the country. Uh, mostly uh, on the one side, we have been seeing a political and eco economic pressure against the Iran, as they have been calling the maximum pressure, and as well as a military threat against the country in order to bring the uh, Iran to the negotiating table under the conditions that the United States wants to have with Iran. Uh, but uh, I, I would say that by I mean, making those military threats, as well as uh, suggesting the negotiations with Iran, they want to have a kind of pressure and the carrot and stick approach toward Iran in order to have a new deal in place. Uh, but uh, I think this has been the case in the past, as it happened during the George W. Bush. They want to have 
They wanted okay. to have also let me, zero. I'm going to I'm going to cut you there. I'm sorry, Mr. Abbas. Let me let me just add uh, that while you say that these kind of military threats come in from the U.S., we are also then uh, let's be fair. We are seeing and hearing of military threats come from Iran in the same way. I mean, this uh, parliamentarian is not the only one who has said uh, talked about the aircraft carrier. Uh, in uh, uh, the uh, close to Iran, which has 7,000 men, it would take one attack, and they could completely uh, drown the ship as they came. So th things are heating up. There are barbs being exchanged here. Is there any possibility that Iran would see through Trump's statements a po a an invitation to maybe come and talk, or is that door completely closed? You know, uh, I would say that if the condition exists in the, in the same way, Iranians will not uh, engage in the talks with the Americans unless Americans return uh, to the commitments they had under the nuclear deal and unless they remove those sanctions that were supposed to be gone under the nuclear deal, as well as, let's say, they promise not, to, not the same approach to be uh, repeated in, in, in future. Okay. But okay. uh, according to the confusion and the lack of consensus in the United States, I think it's not quite clear yet whether what Americans are really after a okay. negotiation, negotiation or, or a new a... deal or not. Okay. All right. Uh, Mr. Paul, we've got the last minute here. We've got two questions, so I'm going to club them together for you. We've still not answered quite what the plan here is for the U.S. Is it the regime change? Was it the JCPOA? You've already said that was an excuse. Then... Will it be a regime change in the U.S. or will it be a regime change in the Iran, in Iran, where we can finally see some kind of meeting halfway? Because the the question remains unanswered whether this is actually a chase after Iran for their proxy warfare in the region. Yeah, it's going to be an interesting, interesting question over the next few months to see uh, exactly what happens with uh, Europe and if Europe is able to really provide through its new uh, trade exchanges. Um, enough uh, economic uh, economic stability for Iran to to not move too far with this nuclear program. We did hear early this week from the uh, the IAEA um, that Iran has now breached the 300 kilogram limit on its stockpile of low enriched uranium, which is a very small thing. It could easily be turned back. It's not a proliferation uh, threat in any uh, in any chance, uh, but. The next few months are key. Um, I do think dialogue on all sides, even if it's behind closed doors or in secret, is needed um, to de-escalate the situation because the region cannot afford uh, a, a war and nor can the U.S. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Paul there. And uh, Mr. Abbas, as Mr. Mustafa Khush for giving us your time and talking about trying to understand what is happening here in the Middle East between the U.S. and Iran. There is certainly a lot of confusion on how the U.S. wants to take it forward. Just recently, in the past few days, there was a tweet uh, from the U.S. State Department that essentially said that Iran had been violating the clauses of the JCPO deal even before it existed, to which Mr. Jawad Zarif, the foreign minister of Iran, replied very aptly in a tweet saying, seriously, question mark. And that will pretty much wrap up the segment for now. We'll take a quick short break and we'll be right back. Welcome back to Newswire with me, Aiza Umar. In the first part of the show, we talked about how U.S. has taken on Iran in this ensuing recent battle. Of course, acrimony between the two has existed for decades now. But on the other hand, we see the U.S. trying to negotiate with once arch enemy, the Taliban, to come to a peace deal before September. Now, U.S. officials and the Taliban have also started the seventh round of talks on Saturday in what one U.S. official said was the make-or-break moment in efforts to end this 18-year war. Taliban spokesman Sohail Shaheen on Sunday said that this round of peace talks between the U.S. and the Taliban is critical. They are meeting with Washington's peace envoy al Khalil Zad in Qatar, where the Taliban also have a political office. Now, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, in a surprise visit to Kabul last week, said they are hopeful that a peace deal will be finalized before the presidential elections in Afghanistan this September. He also said that, and I quote here, I want to be clear, we have not yet agreed to a timeline to do so. Which is, uh, unquote, which is, and now this statement in itself, of course, holds many meanings. We will try to unpack this with our guests along with what this chapter of peace talks could entail for peace in the region. We have today with us journalist uh, Mr. Farzad Lamy from Washington, D.C., 
And let me tell you a little about Mr. Farzad. He is now working as a contractor with the U.S. Department of State and Diplomatic Language Services. And he's recently also won the Rumi Award for Best Social Media Journalist in Las Vegas in the United States. So he was a really good person to have on board right now to try and unpack what not just Pompeo is saying, but what is unfolding behind the scenes. Also, we have with us Mr. Sayed Esan Tahiri. He is joining us uh, in a little bit. But let me introduce Mr. Ahmed Murid Partao, the former senior national representative of Afghanistan to U.S. Central Command in Florida right now. Thank you to both of you gentlemen for joining us here. It's a, a, a very interesting turn of events. The seventh round of talks is taking place right now. Uh, Mr. Ahmed, if we can start with you to just try uh, and unpack what uh, this could be. Could this really be a make and break moment for the Taliban or is this more for the U.S.'s sake? Uh, well, uh, th thank you for the question. Uh, as we are uh, starting, as the U.S. and Taliban are starting the seventh round of the, uh, round of the peace talks in Doha, Qatar, uh, the hope is that there uh, is a breakthrough between the between the Taliban and the, uh, and, the, and the U.S. And we know that the U.S. is uh, offering a package. You know the uh, the four elements uh, framework of peace that. Uh, Continue uh, that consists of uh, ceasefire, uh, uh, talking to the Afghans, counterterrorism, insurance, and uh, uh, troop withdrawal. But on the other hand, you see uh, the Taliban uh, uh, demanding withdrawal of U.S. forces, a timetable, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's see how, uh, how these uh, events out, uh, uh, unfold uh, in, in the future. Uh, but uh, uh, the U.S. has made it already clear that nothing is agreed uh, uh, until everything is agreed in this uh, in this package that is offering. But the Taliban are uh, still insisting on the withdrawal of the force, uh, U.S. forces on Afghanistan, which the U.S. doesn't seem to be prepared to do so. Okay, so here, Mr. Farzad, let me you into this conversation also, trying to understand what exactly the U.S. Secretary of State here means when he says, well, by September, we're really hopeful we're going to reach a peace deal, but at, by no means this, uh, in, and let me just interpret one interpretation from analysts is that this should be seen as a sign of weakness of us conceding that we will be withdrawing. What do you make of it? Thank you for, ha for having me, actually. I uh, uh... I disagree with the United States approach to this, these negotiations. First, uh, they are signaling, as you said, um, they're trying to find a deal uh, based on which they can withdraw their troops. And this is a signal of weakness. I wouldn't say a signal of weakness, but they're uh, giving a signal that we are leaving Afghanistan at any cost. So the Taliban is taking this opportunity and trying to gain more at the negotiating uh, table. Mm -hmm. So what the U.S. Uh, has achieved in the past six round of talks, uh, but the uh, Taliban has achieved a lot of things. They have uh, gained uh, international recognition. They're traveling to uh, countries like Moscow, China, and other places without any restrictions mm -hmm. and return the u.s has got nothing in the meantime the afghan government has been sidelined so they are not involved in these uh, talks and the taliban are yet to confirm to sit down with the afghan government okay but i i'd just going to play a devil's advocate here mr farzad you say the mosque uh, the taliban has uh, had more to gain out of these more to win more support but at the same time, while they may be visiting Moscow, they're still enlisted as a terrorist organization by the Moscow government. While they might be uh, recognized internationally, they still, their individuals, still have sanctions from uh, various countries, not just the UN, but also other Western countries. Do you really think this is uh, them winning here? Or maybe they're just giving up? I mean, how long can they fight? How many more people of their supporters can they lose in the battlefield in Afghanistan? Uh, well, it's it, when they are traveling to Moscow, it's a political game. It's not about like the Moscow is uh, really wanting to uh, find a way, a solution for the Afghan conflict. They're actually uh, uh, trying to see their, they're seeing a future vacuum in Afghanistan uh, when the United States leaves. So they are trying to have influence in Afghanistan. And that's the Taliban right now, because the Afghan government is trying to help with the United States right now. 
Mm-hmm. And now the Moscow, they ignore the, 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 the UN sanctions on the travel ban on the Taliban officials. And they recently traveled to China. And actually, they have removed, uh, as far as I know, the United States, the United Nations has removed some uh, travel ban on some uh, key Taliban uh, negotiators so they can travel freely to okay. countries to negotiate uh, with rivals. Okay, so here I want to bring in for both of you so you can take a listen to U.S. President Donald Trump in his latest interview uh, to a U.S. uh, news channel. Let's take a listen to what he said about the Taliban about Afghanistan. We call it the Harvard of terrorists. When you um, look at the World Trade Center, they were trained. Uh, They didn't, by the way, they attacked their own country. They didn't come from Iraq. All right, they came from various other countries, but they all formed in Afghanistan. And it's probably because it's at the base of so many countries, but they all formed, and it's rough mountains, and you get a lot of, you know, you get a lot of good hiding places. So, Mr. Ahmed, U.S. President Donald Trump, who is right now leading the the conversation in Doha, who, who is pushing for peace in Afghanistan, calling it the Harvard of terrorists, what do you make of it? Uh, sure, the U.S. has uh, still that uh, <clears throat> the U.S. still has that concern regarding Afghanistan. As I mentioned, uh, the part of the four elements peace uh, uh, package framework that Washington is offering to the Taliban. One of the most important elements of this package is counterterrorism assurances. Mm-hmm. And for uh, for those obvious that uh, we just heard uh, President Trump uh, saying that Afghanistan could be used as a launching pad in the future right. uh, against the United States and its allies. Right. Uh, so for this reason, the United States is trying to uh, achieve a counterterrorism uh, assurances uh, from the Taliban that the Taliban should renounce violence first mm-hmm. and cut their ties with the international fighters uh, and, and in some cases even fight those international uh, well, here's, that, here's uh, where the problem it, is. You know. Sorry to cut you here, Mr. Ahmed. And I, and I would ask you, Mr. Farzad, to jump in whenever you deem and uh, you have to say something on this. Here's the problem with this situation. When Trump comes out and says that this is the Harvard of terrorists, and then he goes around uh, through his uh, representatives saying there's a deadline, we're pretty sure we're going to make it work by September. And then you hear reports from Afghanistan of ISIS fighters being recovered by not just the Afghan National Army, but also the U.S. forces there on the ground, it really sends a very confusing tone, Mr. Ahmed. Uh, well, the, uh, undoubtedly, there are uh, international fighters, international terrorists uh, present in Afghanistan, and uh, they, their alliance with the Taliban goes back to the 1990s, you know, and that's a big concern, obviously, uh, for, uh, for U.S. And, and NATO. Mm-hmm. Uh, and until that the Taliban are uh, breaking their uh, ties with these forces, uh, it will be very difficult to, to achieve a peace process and to achieve a peace uh, talk with the Taliban. Uh, and, okay. and we know the alliance between the Taliban and these, uh, and these international uh, fighters, specifically al-Qaeda, is very deep. Uh, they are brothers in arms. They are brothers uh, of, of blood. They are fought together, they, they have died together, uh, so it's going to be very difficult to break those, uh, those ties. Okay, thank you so much there. We had Mr. Emma joining us from Florida. Uh, Mr. Farzad, I'll ask you the same question I asked Mr. Ahmed. What exactly is the message here when at one time they are picking up Taliban arch enemies, the ISIS, who've been fighting neck to tech in the northeastern part of Afghanistan uh, and giving them protection, these ISIS fighters? And on the other hand, they're talking about how this is a breeding ground for terrorists. So before I get to that, uh, let me add something, something just uh, Hamad said about uh, ties between the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. Uh, in the past two weeks, Al-Bayan website, which is affiliated mm-hmm. in uh, uh, information hub for the Al-Qaeda network, they, they promoted the Taliban social media uh, and they're persuading their followers to follow the Taliban accounts. So that proves that they still uh, keep ties. So as Ahmad said, they're unbreakable. They, 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 they are not uh, separated from each other right now. So uh, they, they, they never bend. 
Uh, so uh, when the, the President Trump said that uh, call Afghanistan as a harbor of terrorists. But the, well, I'm sorry, um, I'm, I'm confused here. But the ISIS isn't the Al Qaeda. They're completely different entities. Yeah, but I just added to what okay. Ahmad said about Al Qaeda and the Taliban. All right. Uh, yes. And when President Trump said that uh, Afghanistan is a harbor of uh, terrorists, when he wants to keep intelligence, a strong intelligence in Afghanistan, it doesn't mean it's only for Afghanistan. Uh, let me just include here in conversation Mr. Sayyid Ehsan Tahiri. He's the director of strategic communications and public outreach to High Peace Council of Afghanistan, joining us from Kabul. Thank you so much, Mr. Sayyid Ehsan Tahiri, for joining us, for giving us the time here. What we're talking essentially about is when uh, President Trump comes out and says on a news interview, just when the seventh round of Doha talks are taking place, between the Taliban and the U.S. representatives there, that uh, Afghanistan is a breeding ground for terrorists. And essentially, if they leave, they will leave with a very strong intelligence network. What exactly is he trying to convey here? Thank you very much for the uh, for, for, for uh, keeping me to, to join this uh, conversation. Uh, of course, uh, he doesn't mean that Afghanistan is the ground for terrorists at the moment, because we, are, uh, we have a state, we have uh, pillars of state that uh, all are functioning. And we have a little bit problems in the peace process, but that doesn't mean that we are not moving forward. Mm -hmm. It means that when uh, the international support is not there, when Afghanistan doesn't have a state, that we fortunately have it. And we have the people uh, that they are not people of uh, the past, people of the yesterday or people of 18 years back. We are the people that uh, our new generation is now 18 years and they are reaching uh, to the next generation so that they are considering Afghanistan forward, not Afghanistan backward. Uh, he means that Afghanistan is when, it's, when it's not supported, that will, again, he considers not uh, kind of 100% sure. He says that it will be uh, uh, cross backward, so that the terrorists were sanctuaries were in Afghanistan and somehow in other countries. And when it is not supported, when there is no peace, when there is no government, then Afghanistan will be, of course, a yard for, 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 for the extremists, for the terrorists and for those who are trying to, to get the spoilers assistance and uh, destroy the region the same mm -hmm. that they damage the international community uh, with their explosions with their suicides with their right. attacks and acts. so also let me ask you this uh, mr sayed that at the same time they seem to have some progress where taliban have agreed to meet the uh, kabul government They've, uh, go, they're expected to have these meetings soon, or in fact, they're uh, taking place already now in Qatar. What changed here? Do you think this was a progress that was eventually going to be reached or something important has taken place? Well, uh, the peace process at the, end, at the end of the day will have definitely a positive result, if not completely, but of course, uh, more than 50% to 70% results positively. So this is a peace process. It doesn't mean we didn't expect the peace process of Afghanistan to, to reach it uh, at the end of the day with 100% sure that we will get But Mr. Peace, Sayed, uh, sorry to interrupt you here, but it's hard to imagine that, to see it with the, that optimism, because on the, on, the, on the lines, on the parallel, we see on the ground what is happening. Just recently, an attack that injured 50 children, a, a bomb attack, uh, which Taliban was happy to take responsibility for. It's hard to imagine that this can be working in a positive manner. It is a hard time for Afghans. It's a hard time for us, for everyone in Afghanistan living. Uh, this is a geography that we, 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 we witness much more damages than this. And the same, uh, this was a, a, a dangerous uh, a witness for the people of Afghanistan. But this is the situation that we want to change it to a peaceful situation. This is the time we want to work for peace. This is the time we're working for security and stability in Afghanistan that should be sustainable and that should be respected between the neighboring countries, the region, and international community. But and here's, the, the, here's my question. Let me, sorry to interrupt you again. But here's my second question then. If that is the case, it's very clear that the Kabul government, obviously, and it said it from day one, that we want you to sit down and talk to us. And the Taliban have completely been refusing. In fact, point blank said that we want to have nothing to do with the Western-backed puppet Kabul government. But here suddenly you see a change of heart. Is this got to do with maybe some back channel talks where the Afghan government and the Taliban have come to an agreement behind the scenes that there is going to be a very lucrative power sharing formula eventually? 
Well, considering the situation in Afghanistan and considering the peace process, when we say peace process, peace talks is in the process. It doesn't mean peace process is a peace talk. So when it starts uh, from the national consensus building to international and regional consensus coordination and initiative coordination, that means we are stepping forward for a direct and official negotiations, that's unconditional negotiation package between the government of Afghanistan and the Taliban. Mm -hmm. we, 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 we witness the progress uh, in between the Taliban and the government. So that doesn't mean that they will start tomorrow. It, it may take some more days, some more weeks, then we will have the direct official talks because there is no any other mm -hmm. mechanism than the official and direct talk between the government and the Taliban, because the government is the official entity, the constitutional right. entity on behalf of the people of Afghanistan to decide. Okay. No one aims without the government's interference, without the government's management with the Taliban, because they will be then implementing the peace deal. And hopefully there are positive uh, uh, positive uh, steps forward okay. amongst both sides. So you're this confident. This dialogue that, right. Afghan, that Afghans are uh, attending uh, the 7th and 8th of July mm -hmm. intra-Afghan dialogue in Doha, mm -hmm. that is a an official step forward between Afghans and the Taliban, so that right. that facilitates the intra-Afghan dialogue to reach the official dialogue between the okay. government. Of so, Mr. Farzad, we're, yeah, right. sorry, I'm going to interrupt. We'll leave you at that, Mr. Ahmed, because we're running, sorry, Mr. Sayed, because we're running out of time here. Mr. Farzad, I'm curious to get your opinion on this also. Is this to be interpreted as the success of a, a peace talk process? Or is this to be interpreted as maybe that one of the sides are waning here? Because let's not forget that just last year we've seen uh, a number of U.S. Uh, Army officials having died. Just since 2001, there have been uh, over two uh, and a half thousand military men that have died. Is it? Uh, what do you? What's your take on this? Uh, first, let me correct you. The Taliban has not yet agreed, agreed to meet with the Afghan government. Uh, the next week, a meeting in uh, Doha is intra-Afghan uh, dialogue conference between Afghans and the Taliban. And everybody who is uh, participating in these talks will be participating in their own in individual capacity. capacity. But what does that even yes. mean? I mean, it, just having that personal so capacity added Taliban, to it doesn't really change anything, does it? I agree. I, I get back to my uh, first comment. The Taliban has gained a lot in these negotiations. They have not given up on any of their demands. For example, they're still not ready to meet with the Afghan government. And the Afghan government is not sending anyone representing the government into talks, uh, which is uh, scheduled to be held uh, next week in Doha. Uh, the Taliban uh, insists that once the timeline for the U.S. troops withdrawal is announced, then they are ready to meet with the Afghan uh, Afghan government. Actually, they are still saying not government with the Afghans. Mm -hmm. But as Mr. Tahiri said, it, uh, it's a legit government. It's a constitutional okay. entity. So uh, yes, we uh, the Afghans have some problems in the government or I any government. In they so have a problem. So in just because we're running out of time, I'm going to ask you to uh, bring it uh, to a concise. Is it a step forward uh, in terms of them finally agreeing on uh, how they're going to have a power sharing agreement or whatever with the government with the government representatives not quite the government representatives is that what you're saying any negotiations uh, negotiations are a step forward but it doesn't mean that we're okay. expected this whenever okay. there is a direct talks with the afghan government and the taliban without any conditions that i would consider that a, a positive sign okay all right. Well, we've, that's all the time we have. Thank you so much for joining us, Mr. Farzad, and also Mr. Sayyid Santahiri for giving a take here on how the progress, it seems, is being made between uh, the U.S. and the Afghan Taliban. And before we end, we want to leave you with some spectacular images from Tuesday. While the sky darkened in South America, people got together and witnessed a solar, solar eclipse, a total solar eclipse. In fact, there were reports that the temperature uh, in the area immediately dropped by 10 degrees. The wind picked up, which is something pretty expected uh, when an eclipse like this takes place. And also, interestingly enough, there were spots reserved on mountaintops where helicopters were shuttling celebrities to witness this spectacular event. You'll catch lots of images online also on our social media feed and videos of this spectacular event, which last took place in 2017. 
And those were some really spectacular images of the total solar eclipse that was seen in South America. Well, it's time for us to leave now. We will see you next week with a new round of programs from the news around the world. Till then, goodbye.